Well, today's lecture could very easily be the first day for a conventional mechanics class in the sense that we're going to do the calculus of Lagrange's equations. And uh, we have an advantage, of course, in knowing some of the geometry that we've talked about already for these. But that geometry only gave us the first Lagrange equation or the first Hamilton equation. You've got to get the second of each. And that's coming today with this uh, approach, which is almost standard. The thing that's not standard about it is this. And that is where we use the covariant and contravariant vectors of coordinate uh, systems. Just out of curiosity, how many uh, people here are familiar with covariant, contravariant, differential geometry, really? But it's the way you do mechanics if you're going to be doing relativity. Has anybody uh, come across this in your studies so far? Anybody? Nobody. Okay, well, that's unconventional. It's unconventional for mechanics books to treat that. But that's really stupid because it's so powerful. And uh, we'll try to show you some of that power today. We'll be using a, a technique that works for the absolute worst coordinate systems in the universe. Generalized curved linear coordinates. Most of uh, what you've done if you've taken a differential geometry uh, course is orthogonal curved linear coordinates. We're going to do one of those today. It's the polar coordinate system. But that's enough to show how this stuff works. And uh, then we'll go ahead and use it uh, to make, um, to make, be able to use the Lagrange equations. But of course, we have to derive the Lagrange equations. Hamilton equations will come in the uh, following lecture. We're going to focus on the French approach uh, today, uh, as far as the differential calculus goes. So uh, we've got the. Uh, usual front end to this lecture that has stuff from the previous lecture. There are the uh, first <coughs> equations of Lagrange and Hamilton. The second equations are trivial for a situation in which there is no potential or force acting on whatever the uh, mechanical system is. The second equations deal with that. Here that is zero, so they're not mentioned. But they're hiding. Uh, in the geometry anyway. So that will uh, be coming uh, here uh, very shortly. Okay, so uh, let's get the terms down first of all. We've already talked about using partial derivatives and chain uh, connections to make total derivatives, or in this case, total differentials. This sum here of a partial derivative for two independent variables, x and y, uh, is um, uh, fairly obvious. But we're going to be working with the very simplest curvilinear coordinate system, one which is actually orthogonal. But the methods that we're going to be using um, can take any coordinate system, orthogonal or not. In fact, it can take uh, the mesh of coordinate um, or trajectories that we were talking about for the volcanoes that made the envelopes that you're going to be working on for this week's uh, problem. That is a coordinate system itself. And that's really powerful to realize that, is that uh, if you really get control of, the, of your coordinates, the coordinates can be the actual solution to the mechanics problem. But also, it lets you get a, a, a leg up on how classical mechanics connects to quantum mechanics, and that's going to be coming in a couple of lectures. Anyway, this is the notation uh, for GCC, the Generalized Curve Linear uh, Coordinates. And uh, every uh, book that uses this that I've seen when they introduce the subject uh, uses the letter Q. Uh, what does that stand for? I always wondered. And I'm just posing a guess that these are queer coordinates. They can get very pretty queer. Uh, they're not lines, they're curved, okay, they're not going straight, 
they are making a curve. Okay, so Q is a good letter maybe if you're uh, taking up our sociology and mixing it with our mathematics. In any case, the basic idea is that a chain rule uh, is very much the beginning of any discussion of differential properties with these uh, coordinates. So the chain rule that we have here with x and y, uh, we're going to have it with r and theta for a polar coordinate system. And we're going to be interested in the transformation matrix that connects the differentials of Cartesian to the differentials of whatever, in this case, uh, two-dimensional uh, polar uh, coordinates. Now, um, bigger things are coming, and you can see the uh, formulas for the uh, generalized curvilinear calculus on the wall over there on the extreme left, and then the next uh, column over from that. Uh, we're going to discuss today uh, the first parts of that. The covariant uh, vectors that have indices that hang down, and then the contravariant vectors that have indices up in the air. I think of the iron contras uh, holding their knives aloft uh, when I think of a contravariant vector. But these are two kinds of differential uh, thing. One, one uh, with the independent variable on the up part of the partial derivative, and the other one with the independent new independent, the queer variable uh, on the lower part. We'll get to that in just a thing here. But there is one thing, one shorthand um, technique that uh, is absolutely important to uh, get used to. Uh, and this will follow you in any course on relativity uh, that uses this stuff. But it's what we're going to do, all of our mechanics with this sort of uh, a notation. And that when you do a sum over some set of coordinates, queer or otherwise, uh, the idea is if you see two repeated indices on the same side of an equality sign, particularly on the right-hand side, uh, that means to sum over that index. So uh, this, this uh, uh, expression right here, you've got to get used to it. When you see two indices, that means you, you're supposed to sum over those. You're supposed to do this with however many degrees of freedom there are in this uh, case of mechanics problem. So uh, that is the first thing to get used to uh, when dealing with uh, tensor notation is what this is often called. Okay, um, see if there's anything here. So index M repeated on the same side, that's equivalent to being uh, a sum over that. Okay, that's um, just part of it. Now, I would recommend that when you're doing uh, complicated equations, more than we're going to do here, uh, and that involve many sums, that you draw a connection line between the things that are being summed. This is when you're, you know, working with a pencil and paper uh, to do this. This is, you know, an okay thing for scratch paper. It's really difficult to arrange something like that in a text. Um, I've never seen it uh, done, but uh, there are times when you would really like to have it done to keep track of things. Okay, so let's get started uh, just with uh, this, and uh, we'll be uh, bringing up other things uh, as well along the way here. So I'm going to get this uh, screen working as well with, um, with the basic lemmas uh, that we need in order to build the equations of Lagrange. And I mean both of them, both sets of them. Okay, so let's get that stuff sort of up, on, up, up front on uh, all of the uh, screens uh, that we have available to us today. And that's four wonderful, uh, very clear screens. And this is the key, I call it lemma one, for setting up mechanics using curvilinear coordinates. So uh, we have to define a generalized velocity. I've already mentioned this before, but when we do uh, a differential x uh, for a particular x, y, and z, this would usually be a notation for a Cartesian coordinate, 
that is going to be expressed in terms of curvilinear differentials. And in mechanics, we're going to be worried about the velocity. The velocity is going to be dx dt, total derivative with respect to time. And that is also indicated here with x dot. Now, um, at this point, I'm being very careful to put the index of the Cartesian coordinate up in the air. That is a superscript, not a subscript. That's the thing that uh, you have to uh, get used to, uh, something else to get used to as we do this. And that's going to be true for the uh, coordinates themselves. Um, I once wrote a paper on, on what a covariant, that is a sub-index, a curvilinear coordinate would be, but that's, I'm not even going to talk about that. that this doesn't happen in the literature. That, uh, the basic idea here is a chain rule giving the total derivative of a Cartesian coordinate in terms of these coefficients, which are these partial derivatives of Cartesian versus the curvilinear. Now, um, and this is the lemma that we get from this expression here. This right here is a differential chain rule. This is simply telling us that the uh, partial derivative of this with respect to the queer velocity will be the same as the partial derivative of the coordinates themselves, x versus q. That's uh, something that uh, really a, a key thing that should be emphasized before we get going any, anywhere here. In any case, the matrix that we are producing, this matrix right here, which is equal to this one using the velocities, just by the structure of these equations, is called the Jacobian matrix. Okay, this is something you probably have heard of in advanced calculus, right? But nobody's responding. You must have heard of this, right? The Jacobian, okay. All right. <laughs> Please respond. That's <laughs> good. It's, it's essential. We have to go back and explain all of the details and think of that. But we're essentially doing that right here. With our uh, uh, co uh, co polar coordinates, uh, we're, 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 the uh, answer for these is just a, a cosine and a sine and then a minus sine with a uh, radius uh, there. So that um, will be what we work with today. Everything we do today right up to understanding Coriolis and centrifugal forces and energy uh, will be uh, based on this, this, this creature, this, this Jacobian. Uh, but we uh, don't stop there. Uh, something I call the Kajobian is, is just a flip of the Jacobian. Instead of doing partials of Cartesian with respect to the uh, curvilinears, uh, it's the curvilinears with respect to the Cartesians. Okay, so that thing turns out to be the inverse of this Kajobian, the inverse of the, of the Jacobian. And um, there is one mathematician responsible for this. Uh, Jacob uh, is um, French. This is more French stuff. Uh, there is no Kajo that I know of. But anyway, it's just a joke. Okay, but in any case, these uh, two matrices uh, that we'll be working with, this and its inverse, and its inverse, if this is the matrix, is this. And you have to divide by that determinant. And when you do this sort of thing, when you're building a mechanics problem, this is the first thing you need to do everything uh, that builds the, the, the guts of a, a classical mechanical calculation. And I always say, check. Always test that your Kajobian really is the inverse of your Jacobian. And so uh, an inverse of a 2x2 two two matrix is really simple. All you do is switch the A and the D and put minus signs on the B and the C, and then divide by the determinant. So that's a little, little shortcut there that works for 2x2 two two stuff. And that's all we're going to be doing today, so that's all we really need for what we uh, 
uh, have here. Okay, so that is um, the check right there that you do get uh, this um, this inverse uh, when you um, make this. So you get a unit matrix with a determinant of a multiplying it, a two by two determinant. Okay, Let's see if there's anything else here that I should uh, probably uh, say. That's this, uh, the other. Uh, way of saying that, and that is that uh, when I multiply these two together, I have a partial derivative of Q with respect to X summed over, this is a sum over the XJ, uh, and then the partial respect of the second uh, curvilinear variable. And that comes out to be this. And the partial derivative of this with respect to any of the other coordinates is absolutely zero. But the partial derivative of, of, of one of these with respect to itself, QM of QM, is 1. It's just plain 1. So this is a, a very simple example of an inverse matrix situation for this calculus. So here they are, Jacobian and its inverse, the Kajobian. Okay, Let's see if there's anything else I need to say about that. I think that's great. Okay. Now, the next step here is to get this GC stuff uh, ready for mechanics. And in particular, uh, we've taken care of velocity here. It's, you don't need another Jacobian to describe uh, velocity. You do the same uh, Jacobian for velocity and for the coordinates. That's, that's, that's great. That, that's uh, uh, really nice because it's not going to be that way for long. With the uh, uh, second derivative, the acceleration, and another lemma, we need lemma two to handle that situation. It's just a tiny bit more complicated. But this is a big tripping point for the derivation of uh, Lagrange's equation. We have to get this right. Uh, generalized acceleration is weird in curve coordinates. You've got uh, linear coordinates, no matter how mixed up they are, eh, you don't need this. But everything we're going to do is have at least one curved coordinate, like our polar coordinates, that's circles. So, uh, here we are going to be applying a total derivative differ differentiation to a velocity. Okay? And the product rule will uh, work for us. So we're going to be uh, looking at this particular Cartesian velocity expressed in terms of Jacobian coefficients and the uh, curve linear coordinate velocities, the generalized velocities. Okay? And we have to take the total derivative of that. So it's the total derivative of a Jacobian uh, times Q dot and then this guy right here. How do these things change with the Q? Okay? And that's going to give us the uh, accelerator the generalized acceleration. So the question is, how do we handle something like that? We're uh, going to do the chain sum, uh, apply that uh, in uh, both of these uh, uh, situations here. But um, this is all stuff that's, as I say, not in the text. But uh, partial derivatives are reversible. Okay, this is. Uh, so we made a fuss about that in lecture nine. So uh, here's a chance to do that. We're going to be talking about uh, here uh, expanding the um, to 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 use the expansion. I'm going to to take this uh, uh, right here and sum over uh, all of the curvilinear coordinates of this quantity, this Jacobian. So this Jacobian quantity here is having its partial derivative taken for each of the, um, in this case, two coordinates, r and theta. And uh, I'm multiplying each one of them by the generalized velocity of that uh, particular coordinate. So here's the partial derivative of a partial derivative. There it is in that form. Flip it, okay, flip it so that you get a partial derivative of, with respect to qm of this quantity here, the total derivative, and then summed over the uh, 
curvilinear coordinates index n equal, well in our case, r and theta are the sub-indices uh, labeling this. Okay, so um, what this gives uh, here, the uh, <clears throat> thing, an important thing about mechanics to always recall is uh, the co uh, coordinates uh, <clears throat> are independent of velocities. That is, uh, you start out asking where something is, and then you say, I'm going to hit that and give it a little extra uh, speed. I could give it some velocity. Uh, the quantities of, of either, each of those are uh, available for, to you to change arbitrarily at first. So treating those as independent variables is an important part of this. But in any case, just writing this thing according to the chain rule is giving me a partial derivative with respect to Q of the velocity. That's uh, lemma two. Total time derivative of the Jacobian is a little bit more complicated. It's the partial derivative with respect to the independent curve linear variable of the Cartesian <coughs> velocity in this case. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and just put both of these here. These are the two things, two calculus things that we absolutely need in order to build uh, Lagrange's equation in a conventional uh, way and using curve linear coordinates, which is, is very powerful. Okay, so there we are. Now, at this point, I think I'm going to advance at least one of those to come to this point because uh, we're, we'll be using uh, that. I think uh, probably better for me to advance this one. Let's go ahead here and get to these point right there, okay, where these two things are, are shown. Because we're going to make use of those. Big use. All right. So, uh, the idea is, it's really a funny way to say it, but I say, how do you say Newton's F equal MA in GCC? That's, that's really what this is all about. Using, you, you, the idea is to use the Car Cartesian uh, expression for the kinetic energy, the thing we started with on the first day, the thing that gave us ellipses in a velocity space, okay? And later on, after we started talking about forces and potentials, we were able to make a connection between a force and an acceleration, somewhat tenuous based on uh, just kinetic uh, hittery, <laughs> punching. Uh, and what we need here is to take this and get these, this equation uh, in our curve linear coordinates. In other words, the general form of mechanics dynamics uh, is uh, at, uh, uh, in question here. Okay, so uh, what do we have to do in order to get that? That's the, the key thing here. So we have this quadratic form uh, for velocity uh, in, in terms of velocity that gives the kinetic energy. That's, um, remember, something we derived uh, based on the geometry of the velocity of collisions of super ball with a pen, or two balls, two cars. Uh, this expression right here, involving the components of that, doesn't necessarily have to be diagonal. In other words, this will work for mechanics in solids where the mass, the inertia, is different in different directions. Tensorial inertia is just something you're going to have to get used to in this building because that's what's happening in, all, in every crystal. You very seldom have a diagonal mass matrix inside of the uh, stuff that we work with around here. So here we're going to have that. Uh, absolutely, this is going to be part of our story here and we don't necessarily have uh, a diagonal uh, mass matrix. That was just something very special for our super ball collisions. Generally, it's not true. Anyway, this is what the uh, Cartesian um, Newtonian uh, equations look like. And it would be true for however many degrees of frequency. You don't just have to work with uh, two particles. Like 
chapter 3 or 4 or uh, 10 to the 23rd. If you're talking about a whole mall of stuff, that's the classical mechanics you've got to at least think about uh, dealing with in um, what they call molecular dynamics studies. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to take this uh, differential, the Cartesian differential, uh, that expresses the work energy, that is the force times distance that we uh, have. We're going to make use of that differential work, force times distance, now this is again repeated, so it's being summed over all the Cartesian variables that you have uh, moving, and uh, you will uh, replace the differential with the curvilinear coordinates to make it uh, possible to do say all the coordinates that we're going to do today. So we have this and this and that as the um, as as the entree entrance of the curvilinear coordinates into this uh, problem here. Now what, what's also important to realize whenever you do a differential like this and assuming these functions uh, eventually will be continuous functions, the uh, idea is that uh, this will be true term by term. That is, uh, this sum is true simply because I can go ahead and I can hold dq, they're independent variables, I can hold all of them zero except for one. Pick, you pick it, any one. All right? So I must have that a particular term uh, in that uh, expression uh, should be um, valid. In other words, if I, re if I replace this guy here with all zeros uh, in the sum except for the, the 23rd one, which I, uh, I'll make equal to 1, I'm in business. I can just write that equation of, uh, as a, a valid equation. In other words, that's the Cartesian force. Here's an expression for the uh, uh, Jacobian converting a Cartesian force to uh, something that's uh, more general, something associated with a coordinate uh, Q, whatever coordinates you want, R or theta in our uh, polar coordinate case that we're about to do here. So this is the key equation that needs to be converted totally to curvilinear quantities. And that's the uh, Lagrange trickery that's about to come up here. Okay. But in the meantime, realize that at least this has the form of a transformation by a Jacobian of a Cartesian force into a generalized curvilinear force, a, 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 um, just called generalized force. So far, so good? Okay. All right. Well, we're almost there. A couple more screens like this, but not even as, really as complicated as this. And we're in business. Okay. So it's the first stage of what I call Lagrange's trickery. Okay. He's a smart guy. He did something really amazing when he derived this stuff. And they already had a lot of weird coordinate systems that they could think about. Mathematicians are really good at discovering those. In any case, I'm going to take that uh, equation down there, that one term out of a sum that was giving us uh, a, a work expression. This is just one of the components of that, but that's all we need to get an equation of motion. So here I go uh, with this particular m. This is m over here. That means it's a particular m. I'm not, um, going to have to sum over that. I am going to have to sum over these repeated indices here. This k and this j, they both get summed over. So there's four terms uh, coming here and here and so forth. Uh, we need to um, do the trick. The trick is to set the first part of this thing to a, the, part, the Jacobian uh, coefficient to b, and then use a derivative formula, calculus formula, okay? And what we have here is a double time derivative of A 
this thing. Okay. Now there is a catch here. The catch is that um, these Cartesian uh, mass coefficients, they're off diagonal, but they have to be constants. They cannot be functions of, uh, of any coordinate. That would spoil the Lagrange trigger. Okay? So be careful with that. But aside from that, we're, we're good to go here, and that means we don't have to worry about time derivative of that. Just this thing right here. So the time derivatives uh, in this expression give us this right here. Here is the a dot b dot uh, uh, being subtracted uh, from uh, this guy. Okay, so we're taking a total derivative of this expression here with respect to time. And then just not the Jacobian uh, there, but it involves x dot. m dot, that's zero. Okay, so I make that, that is really an important part of this. Now, at first it appears, and I put a little fine print here, bye-bye relativistic mechanics, because those guys, those masses, uh, they vary with speed, so how are you going to handle that? That will come later. But right now we're not worried, we're not going that fast, so we don't have to worry about that. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> we're going to convert these partials of the coordinates and the coordinate dots using these two guys. Okay? That's, that's the trick here. You convert uh, here uh, the <coughs> partial derivative of uh, x with respect to q uh, to uh, x dot with respect to q dot. Okay, lemma one. Right? And then uh, lemma 2 takes care of this one. This is a total time derivative of Jacobian coefficient. Well, that just turns out to be a funny Jacobian that involves velocity differentiated with respect to the coordinates instead of just the coordinate differentiated with respect to the curvilinear coordinates. Okay? So that's it. That's pretty much uh, what gets us uh, to uh, some really nice equations. Now, the idea is to simplify this because basically what we've got here is velocities uh, sitting uh, next to each other that can easily be written uh, as a, a single expression. So what I'm ending up doing here is rewriting uh, a velocity times a derivative of a velocity as a derivative of the curve linear derivative of the velocity squared. So I'm getting an expression here that just is the kinetic energy in uh, Cartesian notation, but that's going to be uh, an expression that will just be absorbed into the equations of motion that we're about to get, Lagrange equations. Okay, so that's the, uh, we're at a point now where we almost have uh, the Lagrange equations. Okay? And, uh, the thing that I am showing here is that uh, equation. This is Lagrange's, we call it Lagrange's GCC force equation. In other words, we a curvilinear force component. And what we've got here is the total time derivative of this partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to curvilinear velocity. And then curvilinear plane coordinate derivative of that same uh, kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy I'm speaking of is the one we started with. One half m v squared, but it's one that's a tensor expression. M j k. Not necessarily diagonal. It doesn't have to be. Okay? So that's that's it. Now I call this the um, uh, the four-wheel drive garbage truck. This equation here does not have a lot of the very peculiar, careful uh, caveats that the other equations that we're about to get have. This one, this one works any anywhere, no matter what. I can trust this thing. So, as I say, it's a four-wheel drive garbage truck. You can take a lot. 
huge load of shit and go anywhere. This is a safe equation. Okay. Once we're going to be driving uh, on that wall over there, most of them are very persnickety about some uh, conditions that you're allowed to do. Um, but this one is really rough. Okay. And it's just Lagrange's force equation with respect to some queer coordinates. Now this is a, often the way we write it. We write it as a gradient in V space and then this wing right here that you're subtracting here is the, is the uh, spatial gradient of kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is going to have um, perhaps um, a, a, a coordinate dependence, but um, it's going to be because it's a curvilinear coordinate system. All right, now we still have the, the last stage of Lagrange's trickery, and that is in order to do forces that can be expressed as a potential. If you have a force of expressed potential, uh, you're good to go. It's, it's as good as gold uh, for um, this business. So I have here um, the demand that uh, this force, this thing sitting right here, can be written as a partial derivative, that is in the gradient, uh, and each component, the curved linear component, will be the partial with respect to that particular queer coordinate. And then, of course, this is the, uh, the, the form of the uh, equation that we had before. Just Fm equals this uh, uh, derivative. Okay. So let's get this into a form that is really easy to remember and easy to use. And then we'll use it. See how, uh, see how it works. But, um, potential equation um, brings up, when we do this, when we have uh, a potential here, uh, <clears throat> we do make one, now I'm making a, a whereas, I'm making some fine print here, I'm saying this trick requires that the potential have no explicit velocity dependence on any of the velocity variables. This has to be identical. Uh, this is we're, 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 go, we're back to the garbage truck, okay? So we're going to get away from the garbage truck, get a nice uh, uh, limousine to take us places. But we've got to have this. We've got to have that potential uh, no velocity dependence. Now later on, we're going to have take on uh, Lagrange's equations for electromagnetism, and you know very well there are forces there that are functions of velocity. And there's a thing there called a vector potential, right? That's the way we'll get out of this little jam right here and be able to do uh, things that involve charges and currents and all that kind of stuff. So let's get uh, caught up here. Um, this is what you get out of doing that. It's really quite nice. As long as the uh, velocity derivative of the u is, I can just stick the u right in there, minus t minus u. Okay, and then this u goes over t minus u, I get zero here. So there is Lagrange's great discovery. Okay, that is um, the way you usually see it written. It's just a total time derivative of the velocity uh, partial of this thing called the Lagrange. We're going to try to figure out what that has to do with classical and quantum mechanics. Uh, very shortly uh, in a couple of lectures later. But uh, right now, uh, this one, the partial with respect to Q, of course, will be very interested in what the derivative of that thing is. Okay, now, just rewrite these things in uh, a couple of different ways. The uh, first one is to realize that the momentum, and this is Lagrange's first equation that we've been through a number of different ways, this thing, the partial with respect to Q dot, Lagrange is, uh, uh, Lagrangian is supposed to be a function, explicit function of velocity uh, to be interesting, to really be interesting and have forces and things like that that are uh, potential driven. Uh, that uh, is going to give us a definition, this is the first equation, is now a definition of 
generalized curvilinear momentum. So if you have established that notation, P curvilinear coordinate M is partial with respect to velocity curvilinear M, then what is the P dot? You see, that's this thing right here. P dot is simply, take this over to the other side, put a plus sign on it, P dot is simply partial L with respect to QM. So the first equation has the dot on the Q. The second equation takes the dot off of the Q and puts it on the P. That's the way to memorize these darn things. That really is very concise. Okay? So this is the one where the momentum actually changes. And all of the other stuff we just got, we didn't have any forces. The ball just went uh, wherever uh, until it got hit. And then there was a change in momentum. But this guy right here, um, that is a momentum which would give zero over here. So we only needed the first equation if, there were, if the momentum is never going to change. But now it is. Okay? This is just tying us up with what we've already um, put together, using mostly geometry. All right. The uh, first symmetry principle that comes out of this is if the L has no explicit coordinate dependence, and that's kind of what the kinetic energy that we worked with had, then P dot is zero. You see, it demands that I have some coordinate dependence before I get any P dot. Okay? So if I don't have a Q coordinates, if some coordinate is, uh, as they call it, ignorable, that's the uh, thing that, that uh, is used, if it's ignorable, then your momentum is conserved for that particular uh, dimension. And we're going to have uh, two dimensions, r and theta here. And very often the theta thing is the thing that you can serve by just having spherical or circular symmetry. Okay? So let's do uh, this discussion now uh, using some real curvilinear coordinates. Very simple. The simplest possible curvilinear coordinate system that I can come up with is just polar. Okay? But this is where we get fancy, and this is what's powerful about using the dual space approach that's given to us by differential geometry and has been responsible for developing almost everything we do in not just general relativity, but special relativity as well, and finally quantum mechanics itself. So uh, here is the Jacobian again, written for a situation that has only two uh, variables, x1, x2, or q1 and q2. And the q1 and the q2 are uh, the ones associated respectively with r and phi, the two uh, variables associated with uh, polar coordinates. Now this is usually the way you define polar coordinates, x equal r cosine of the argument angle, angle phi this way, a positive uh, right-hand rule usually, and uh, the R is the radius. Okay? Now, what you, the, 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 the first step in any mechanics problem is to get the Jacobian, that is to get the coordinate transformation converted to different derivatives so that you can build the Lagrange equations, and later Hamilton, but that's a whole other story. Uh, the idea being that um, these two, um, <clears throat> two uh, Jacobian-like uh, matrices, that's the Jacobian and the Kajobian, the inverse, uh, each of those uh, is, in, is um, directly inverse of the other. Now, it may be that the uh, definition of your coordinates um, going backwards, that is, expressing the coordinates in terms of the Cartesian variables is an impossible function, something you can't even write down. That's 
usually the situation for uh, a really clear coordinates. Uh, here, it's just more complicated. This is really simple definition of the relation between polar and Cartesian. Here, where I'm isolating the polars, I have to pay the price of an arc tangent. That's a, 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 a function uh, that uh, can cause you lots of problems. And then, of course, I have to do sums of squares and then take the square root to get the r. So. Th th this is already for such a, the simplest curvilinear coordinate system showing you that the inverse definition is, is, can be very complicated uh, compared to the uh, Cartesian definition. All right? Well, that's just the way it is. Uh, I can't say much more. But then what you do once you've done the Jacobian and then you just right away take the inverse is you produce in the columns of the Jacobian the so-called covariant vectors, the vectors that have indices that are down. And they're the kind of the, the liberals of this uh, story here. Now, the opposite of the liberals, the conservatives, have their uh, uh, knives up in the air, their indices are up in the air, and they're the contravariants, the contravariant uh, variables. Uh, in this case, uh, E super R and E super phi, okay? Uh, these are the, I would say, the bras of the classical mechanics, and those are the kets of the classical mechanics, okay? This is the dual space that in quantum mechanics uses. Well, uh, we should take advantage of it in classical mechanics as well. So, uh, that is uh, where you stand, and then you can actually read off or plot uh, what these things give you. And you can see this one is really kind of weird because it gives you uh, coordinates that get really big as you get to r small. Okay, where these kind of this one right here, this e phi, okay, it gets big when r gets big. So that's the inverse relationship of these things. So here are the conservatives. They just get real big as you go out. And it's only true of the phi, E sub phi. That's the second one. <clears throat> the E sub 1, the R, well, it's, it, it's going to, uh, this guy right here, it's just going to be the same uh, everywhere. Okay, It's going to be one unit. And I'm going to get into that. It's actually given the de definition of a unit uh, on the grid grid there, a scale. These guys, these are weird, okay? They get bigger and bigger as you get closer to the origin and die off. That's the E super fees, these guys right here, the contra fees. Whereas the contra R's are the same as the codes, they just stay the same uh, size uh, everywhere. Okay, so they're the polar coordinate bases plotted out uh, for you. Now this is sort of a sketch of what we're talking about here in general. You get this now, you don't have to worry about it later on when you're doing really clear coordinates. But let's just uh, get uh, uh, an idea what it is that you're, you're uh, doing here. Now you've got to realize, you see, that the uh, covariants, the guys that are here, are just partial derivatives with respect to whatever coordinate you're talking about. So. Uh, what this would be right here would be the partial derivative of this vector position r with respect to q1, which is r for us. And this one is a, the, the, the partial derivative of that with respect to phi, q2, is, is what we're talking about here. But in general, if I have a curl of any coordinate, I'm trying to draw something that's really sketchy, okay? And I want to point out, these are 2D drawings. Everything's in the plane here. It looks like it's coming out at you. Don't bother with that. It's all in this plane. That's what you get when you have curve in your coordinates. Okay? This guy curves more than that one. Those are less than that. And uh, this is Q1 equal 101. This is Q1 equal 100. This is Q2 equal 200. That's uh, what this thing. This is Q2 equal 201. Okay? So roughly, the distance from two, the one that's 200 to 201 is going to be about 1. So this vector is going to try to tell you what 1 is in this coordinate system at uh, some locale, 100 and uh, 200. 
uh, is the coordinate uh, of this particular point. Okay, so the del the dq2 and the dq1 are uh, being shown here, and they're about one. In fact, th this thing is going to give to is exactly one. It's going to pretend that it's not curved. It's just going to keep track of its slope. Okay. Now these guys, they're, the contours, they're, they're, they're weird. They're all gradients. They're all perpendicular to the coordinate system in question. This one is along the coordinate in question. The coordinate that's changing in que in, 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 that you're talking about here. The E1. Okay. This, this, is what, this is a kind of thing that you have to think about a lot as you're getting used to these um, dual space coordinates. Um, trackers is the best I, name I can uh, that I can give them. Okay, that's uh, that's part of of the story here. Um, I'm exaggerating here. This is what it really looks like for polar coordinates. And um, let's just go some one step further here. And um, <clears throat> at this point, since we're not deriving anything more, I'm going to be jumping ahead down on this screen. And I'm going to put this stuff uh, right up front on that screen. We'll be getting to that in just a minute here. But this is this is the basic idea: is that the covariant bases match cell walls, the geometrical unit of a cell wall. It's based on this chain rule. It's that simple. A differential in the coordinate vector r due to changes in q1 and q2 is that sum. And that sum has as coefficients the E1 and the E2. And each one of those is a particular number that you calculated by a partial derivative. But that's just the chain rule. That's all it is. So the, these, these vectors try to match the cell walls of the, of the um, various pieces of your coordinate system. Now, if you look at the coordinate system with a microscope, then these are all straight and rectilinear, and this uh, differential expression here becomes an exact, exact uh, expre expression of lengths uh, that you have here and here. So, that is an important thing. And E1 follows the tangent to the uh, Q2 equal constant, since only Q1 varies when you have a partial derivative of r with respect to q1, while the other q's, you might have three or four or five of them, uh, they're all staying constant. Then you do the same thing with uh, q2. Okay, So these are convenient bases for what are called extensive quantities like distance, velocity, acceleration, stuff like that. Okay, the Extensive variables, uh, it's convenient. To use. You don't have to do that, but that's, uh, things work out better when you do that. These guys, the guys that are at contras, the ones that are against something, okay, well, uh, they're perpendicular to, uh, this is a gradient, you see, of Q1 equal a constant, and this is the gradient of Q2 equal a constant, so they're a little weird. Now these are called the tangent space, and these are called the normal space, in advanced mechanics, really advanced mechanics, kind of mathematicians do. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that uh, part of your lore. So, E1, normal to the coordinate line that it is uh, responsible to. All right? So that, I think, is really it in a nutshell. But uh, we've still got a little bit to say here. Do these things have the properties of bra ket, more like ket bra, okay, uh, to be uh, a little bit more precise. And they do. What's neat about the covariant contrary is that the curved linear coordinate system can be curved to hell, but you can still demand that the dot product of the, let's call this one the bra now and that one the ket, but I could easily turn it around because uh, dot product is commutative, okay, but uh, the, the idea is that that will always be a delta function. That is, it will always be mostly zero, but whenever they're equal, it'll be one. 
So you don't care about really how the links are all changing as we go to different places or pointing in weird uh, orthogonal directions. This is still going to be true. That's going to make your algebra a lot easier. And it's true just by chain rule. It's just true because the partial of Qn with respect to Qm is usually zero. Only when m is equal to n, then it's one. So that's what's going on here. We're making use of that. Uh, we're taking advantage of that to have the convenience of an orthonormal coordinate system where there isn't any orthonormality at all. You have to make it this way, do the space. Okay? All right. So here is sort of a summary of uh, the structure that uh, we're dealing with here. And I'll leave the pictures of it uh, over there. This is not usually a, a, a non-zero off diagonal. This is called your metric tensor. And that is really important in relativity. Okay, this is the thing that determines what lengths are in space and time. Okay. And it's covariant. But sometimes it's convenient to go to the other extreme and use contravariant metrics. We'll see uh, in our little example of polar coordinates what, what the differences are. And that's uh, a great example. But most of the time, we play the Estrangian game. Here, it's just 1 and 0. Mostly 0, occasionally 1 when they're equal. Okay. So this is the invariant Kronecker unit tensor. That's its definition, right there. This one can be a whole full matrix full of numbers that are not zero, and so can this one. But there's the in-between, you see. So what you're do mainly doing is Lagrange likes this, Hamilton likes that. That's what we'll find out later, but we're just going to do Lagrange today. This is French stuff today. Okay. So our polar coordinate example, uh, as I say, the columns here, those are the one and two components of a derivative with respect to R. Okay? And then the derivative with respect to phi, there's the one and two components uh, for it, x and y uh, components of, of that guy. And we're going to graph that one out. This one, they're kind of weird because they got inverse R, so they blow up as you approach the origin. Uh, that's what contras do. <clears throat> they get close to the uh, center of Wall Street and they get put in jail, eventually. Who knows? Okay, so, um, just to summarize, uh, these are what they look like for polar coordinates. And it's an orthogonal coordinate system. You don't have to worry about the off-diagonal terms if you're dealing with such a, uh, a, a coordinate system that is orthonormal, an OCC as opposed to a GCC. But then, of course, this is always a unit matrix, this guy here. All right, uh, let's go ahead on this one, get all of that uh, down. Wait, is this making sense? Is it, it's, a, uh, it's quite a tale. Right now, uh, this is a typical Lagrangian. I'm just picking any potential whatsoever. That potential will be a chord function of coordinates only, and we'll use uh, the covariant metric uh, uh, for uh, that. There it sits, okay, right here. <clears throat> In this case, we're talking about a single mass, so it's multiplying outside that. All right, and um, this is, as I say, an OCC, so it's, it's very simple. There are no cross terms, there's just RR and phi phi, okay? And we know what those are from 
doing the dot products of our uh, columns of the Jacobi. So just the Jacobian is enough uh, to get uh, to this point. Uh, and so this is a, a nice expression uh, here for kinetic energy and polar coordinates. Okay. Ooh, I see some things I recognize already. R squared M. It's inertia times angular velocity squared. Okay. This thing is just MR squared. I expected that one. MR dot squared. That's radial velocity squared. So no big deal there. But already you see we're, we're getting um, <coughs> expressions for inertia, rotational inertia, phi inertia. Okay. Now, the definition of, um, this is from the preceding page now, the definition of, um, of radial momentum, not really too surprising here, okay? Uh, uh, the momentum R uh, is defined as partial L with respect to R dot. That's um, <coughs> really uh, Hamel, uh, Lagrange's first equation uh, right there, okay? And so I go ahead and I take this thing and I do the partial derivative with respect to r dot. And the uh, 2 cancels the 1 here and I just get uh, m r dot. Big deal. Okay. But r is kind of like it's left over uh, from uh, 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 the uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Where it gets interesting, you see, and really cool, is when I go over here to look at p phi. Okay, partial derivative of l with respect to phi dot. That's a little more complicated because it's got the inertia multiplying these things. So that's cool. It automatically gives you the factor, the inertial factor for this particular angular momentum. This is angular momentum right here, you see. So this is, you see, this is where Lagrange's first equation is at work giving us uh, various quantities. But we still got to look at this guy. That's uh, a little bit more difficult. So uh, let's go ahead, uh, get all of this stuff on this screen as well, okay? And now the next step is to kind of look at um, what the um, contravariant quantities, uh, well, that too, but mainly uh, I'm interested here in the change, the rate of change of the uh, momentum uh, PR and the rate of change of the other momentum, uh, p phi. Okay, so now um, we're going to be asking questions of the second Lagrange equation, okay? p r uh, dot, okay? Well, that's the partial derivative of L with respect to R, so I gotta go into this equation right here, this L equation, and everywhere I see an R, I've got a do something with it. Now g phi phi, that's this guy uh, right here, here, okay, it's giving me that. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, looking at a partial derivative of that with respect to r, but are there any other things in there? Well, yes there is. This thing is a function of r. I uh, uh, deal with it. Okay, so that's a, that's a, the term right there. So what I end up with is the rate of change of the radial momentum will involve two expressions. One of them is centrifugal. M R omega squared. M R phi dot squared. But omega is what we use to describe angular velocity. Okay. And then, if there is any potential that's a function of R, that is going to be subtracted uh, from this. So this thing is going to try to grow the momentum in the radial direction, and this is going to um, subtract from it if it can, if this is positive. This quantity here is positive, it's being subtracted. Okay. Meanwhile, the change in the angular thing, well, uh, partial derivative with respect to phi, I don't see a phi anywhere here except there. And I put that down, but that's the only way the angular momentum can change. If this thing has no explicit phi dependence, it's got a symmetry, it's got a circular symmetry, and it will conserve this stuff. This is a conserved quantity, p phi dot. Okay? That's uh, kind of neat. Um, now, taking the partial derivative of, of a u that had no phi in it, uh, would give me zero for this. So that's a, 
um, a case of conservation. Now, we're still not done yet because we need to find the P dot that's here and there directly from the first Lagrange equation. And that's the, you know, this is the hard work of a, of a mechanics uh, problem that we're uh, doing here. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. I'm going to take this guy right here, okay? I'm taking the time derivative of this thing right here. M is constant, but uh, R dot is not necessarily. So here's an, an, equa an F equal MA equation coming out. But it also involves, you see, it also involves this guy. So when I uh, express P dot R in this fashion, I can also write it as I had before, just from doing the, uh, the partial derivative of L with respect to R. So there's a centripetal center pulling force, um, and it's, being, it's something that's going to be equal to the center fleeing force if nothing uh, is going to move in order to keep something moving. Now this is the one that has the meat. This last thing here is if I take this equation here and do a time derivative. Now this is total time derivative, so I have to put, I have to suspect everything in there as something that can change with time. And I, and when I do that, I get uh, two distinct parts. I get the Coriolis and the centrifugal the, and the angular acceleration part right here. This is the uh, thing that's going to be uh, keeping track of our change in angular in rotational. Uh, uh, momentum, but this one right here is the weird one. Okay. That's the Coriolis that we had a little bit of trouble visualizing when we did it geometrically. This is the case where algebra wins. You just get it right away, and we're going to uh, look at that in some detail uh, right uh, shortly. But this is a whole story of a mechanics problem being solved with curvilinear coordinates elegantly, as elegantly as we know. Now, they're Hamilton's equations, and sometimes they're more elegant, but most of the time, for the practical stuff that you do on a typical exam in mechanics, Lagrange is the, is the uh, one you go for. The Hamilton is going to be working with the, the um, contravariant uh, metric instead of the covariant metric, so you pay a price. Uh, there. Okay, um, let's go ahead here and catch up. Because I'd like to use um, this equation to understand weather. Basically, northern hemisphere weather. And we, we uh, know basically that there is a basic drift uh, associated with the entire atmosphere, uh, more or less trying to keep up with the uh, rotation of the Earth. But then there's a lot of bumps, lows and highs, uh, that occur just from heating uh, non-uniformly. So the question is, uh, what happens when you have a low pressure area? And the atmosphere uh, decides that day to start bringing some wind toward the low pressure area. So everybody out here feels the wind in the direction, uh, more or less, of those arrows. Okay. Well, the equation that's going to really tell us about what happens to the phi variable, that's this guy right here. That's this equation uh, over on the extreme lower right uh, here. This right there. Okay, we're not going to accelerate the rotation of the Earth, so we'll skip this one for now, but that's the guy that we need to work with. That's the uh, P phi dot uh, equation. And um, basically what it's, it's giving you, if you, if you uh, take all of the mass and everything off of it, is you're talking about a minus two Product of velocities divided by radius. Okay, so this is, this is what we're looking at. Now this is um, <clears throat> the case 
where the feed, the, the rotation is, that's involved here, we're in the northern hemisphere, so phi dot uh, very much uh, you know, greater than zero. The uh, idea is that this right here, having this phi dot greater than zero, and r dot less than zero, makes the phi dot dot positive. So uh, that means that the phi dot dot is going to grow uh, in this direction. It's going to go perpendicular. Now, we expressed that before as just the effect of going from a region where the rotation is higher to one where it's lower. And you have already a lot of motion from being up here. You, 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 you end up uh, exhibiting it uh, down here where uh, things are going uh, slower. So uh, the um, basic idea is that this is um, where you make uh, all of our weather systems. If you are <coughs> standing, uh, <coughs> things usually uh, drift uh, this way. If you're standing over here and you told the low is coming, and we had this just the other other day, uh, what you're going to be experiencing is south wind. You're experiencing south wind on this side. It's going to roll in, and then there'll be a storm or whatever on a, on a typical um, typical Midwestern weather day. And then when it passes, you're going to get a nice cool breeze from the north after the, the storm. You see. And this is the way it happens just about every time, even in the winter, but certainly in the summer. Okay, So that, that's the kind of weather that doesn't really hurt you much. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of weather that does hurt you I say warm south winds proceed, storms cool north winds follow them. That's the cyclonic flow in the northern hemisphere. It's just the opposite in the southern. And you don't get this situation if you're in the, below the Tropic of Cancer, above the Tropic of Capricorn. That's called the tropics. And you don't have this. You don't get much of a Coriolis. And then you reverse as you go to South America and South uh, Australia and so forth. Okay. Now, I mentioned a deep quantum rule here that is something we'll talk about later on, but that is uh, flow tries to mimic the external rotation uh, of whatever object it's close to. It's trying to reduce the relative velocity. That's what costs you in quantum mechanics. It also costs you in these uh, things. So the northern hemisphere rotation like this generally is associated with the drift of these things in that direction, but then all of this happens if you get a pressure uh, change uh, that's uh, magnified, being low uh, in this case. Okay, So uh, we just have experienced a terrible, terrible uh, Don, 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 what was the name of the, the, the last? Dorian, I think. Dorian. Dorian. Yeah, Dorian was the uh, one that uh, really made a mess of the Bahamas. Um, <coughs> missed Bermuda by a sheer cloud up off the Bahamas. Anyway, this was Irm, Irma was just a, in some ways worse than that. It, it, it winds also remained uh, peaking at, um, or actually sustaining 185 miles per hour with gusts in the 200s. So, the, the, you know, very similar. This kind of stuff we're just going to be getting all the time uh, as we let the uh, oceans uh, warm up. I mean, the, go underneath uh, this particular storm, uh, the ocean is bath water. I mean, it's 85 degrees. That's what you, um, if you have a, uh, um, a water bed, right? Uh, you, you, you heat it to 85 degrees, that's comfort for human being, okay? And the oceans, they're very comfortable to swim in. But when one of those comes, it's not very comfortable anymore. So that's the one, I guess, lesson that we get uh, for um, today. And this is a, an amazing thing where we're beginning to see some of this stuff. Um, this is... Saturn's North Pole, you know, uh, the arrival of our uh, spacecraft could uh, 
take a picture of that because you can begin to see uh, some of this behavior in um, the uh, planetary, other planets. In any case, um, I hold this up to you as an example of a, of a tremendous algebraic uh, success of Lagrange, uh, the French approach uh, to mechanics. There's a lot more coming, but um, if we look at the wall over there, and you might go ahead and spin the uh, tra trajectory around a little bit, but if you look at uh, the equations that we have derived, uh, they're kind of up here. We've got the momentum as the partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to Q dot. That's with respect to velocity. And that turns out uh, to be the same because the potential has to not be a function of Q dot. It has to be the partial derivative of L with respect to Q dot. So that, that was our second Lagrange equation. The first Lagrange equation, <coughs> I'm sorry, this is the first Lagrange equation. That's P momentum equal partial with respect to velocity. This one is change in momentum. P dot is the coordinate gradient. This is the partial derivative of L with respect to the coordinate. So we put these two side by side on the screen uh, without mentioning the partial t after we got it absorbed into the L. And that's the whole idea of the L. L is t minus v. It's a weird quantity. Kinetic energy minus the potential? What the heck does that mean? Uh, is that something a mathematician gave us because of, of his minus sign missing or what? Uh, we're going to have to solve that one. That's a, something that needs some work. But it, it is, again, based on what we've talked about as far as, and here's our um, a form of uh, what we've already talked about, and that's the Hamiltonian being written as momentum times velocity, summed over other mentions, um, minus the uh, Lagrangian. And then the Lagrangian would be that same product, the action product there, minus the Hamiltonian. So you see uh, this. Now we haven't derived Hamilton's equations yet. There they are. They're weird. Uh, they don't look weird. They don't look any weirder than this, but they are. And then for relativity, we do these guys. These are the Riemann equations. We'll get to that uh, in unit three. We still got to go through unit uh, two, which it's more uh, aimed at doing um, the uh, mechanics without emphasizing covariant and contravariant. But unit three is uh, definitely emphasizing what we talk about today. And I thought you should have it uh, right away. So I can go die now, and you've got mechanics uh, in your head, or at least available to you, uh, more than most courses. We, we've uh, very, we're only, you know, in fifth week here or so, but we're, we're done as far as most mechanics courses are concerned. We haven't done very many problems, but we've got the equations. Most people are reluctant to even talk about Hamilton. We need to talk about Hamilton. That's where the quantum mechanics hides. Okay? All right. Go ahead, swing your yard, and we'll, we'll see you. Um, if you survive blues, bikes, barbecues, and bombs, you can go to the airport and see the uh, bombers <laughs> uh, from World War II. Oh. It's interesting history. You really might want to go see it. It's quite spectacular. Realize what those people were flying around in when they were having a World War II. So. Um, that's all mechanics, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs>